All right, so uh, two o'clock and off, off we go. So uh, this morning in the little keynote section, um, when I was chatting with Mark, uh, intro a little bit, but if you weren't there, um, my name's Tim Pletcher, and I'm the uh, engineering director for application services at Time Warner in the cloud group. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about Mesos on OpenStack. Um, we're gonna run through a couple of uh, demos, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to give you an idea of basically the, the process by which we got this thing ready to go out the door and, uh, and get the uh, users on board it. And we'll show you some things that are, are pretty neat. So first thing I'm gonna do is a little bit of information about what we do, talk a little bit about choosing Mesos and why we went that route. Um, framing the, the, basically the general PaaS platform service that we want to provide and what that means. The ecosystem that you need to put in place when you're gonna roll this type of tooling out so that the engineering teams have all the piece parts they need to be successful, um, productive on the uh, platform as quickly as they can. Um, talk a little bit about some uh, strategic uh, vendors that we work with that have uh, picked up some of the, the load from other work that we would otherwise have to do. And uh, Mesos on OpenStack, um, some design considerations. Uh, talk a little bit about automation and how we approach that, and you're actually gonna see some of that running. Um, and demos, so while I'm talking to you, I'm gonna go ahead and build a cluster and, you know, fingers crossed, uh, it'll go as, as we want it to go. So let's do the cluster build. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fire this Ansible job and it's gonna build a small cluster, three masters, four agents, and that's gonna run in the background while we chat. And when that gets done, we'll circle back around and take a look at it and I'll show you how that get, actually gets wired into our monitoring tooling on the, you know, as part of the build process. And then um, the final thing I would say is because this is gonna be a long running job on a wireless network, uh, <laughs> who brought the offering to the demo gods because this could go really well or it could go, you know, not so well. But, um, but there you have it. So let's, uh, let's kick that job off real quick and we'll come back to it. And I'll just move this over a little bit so it's not so distracting. <laughs> and so if there is a failure, it doesn't immediately become obvious. But um, All right, so who are we? We, uh, we work in the cloud group. So a couple years back, um, Matt Haynes, who, uh, who myself and a bunch of the other folks uh, in the cloud group worked with and for at HP, um, came over to Time Warner and started this group up. And, uh, and the, first, uh, the first team to come in was Jason Ruolt's team, um, and their primary focus out of the blocks was object storage, and then it grew, of course, to include all the other IIS piece parts, and it's been an ongoing process. And so they're, they're 18, 24 months into this deal now, and, and that IIS platform is solidified and, and, uh, and is getting better every day, more features, things that we need to be successful. Um, Matt asked me to come and start the team to do application services. So as you look at, you know, in a, in a company that's a classic enterprise, you know, shop, they're gonna have a whole range of applications. And those applications are gonna span pockets of modernity and also a lot of legacy stuff. So we wanted to be able to put tooling in place that would be there when these teams start to get moving towards service-oriented architectures and, and looking to modernize applications. And it's a, it's a big footprint. So, um, so our job is to go do that work. And so we have two pieces that we're gonna, you know, that, that, that we provide. One is basically a, what I call a general purpose PaaS. And so that's a way, and it's a multi-tenancy platform where any engineering team can come in and they, if they can containerize their, their package, they can, we can give them a fast path to get out and rolling on Mesos. Um, with a lot of these constituent piece parts available to them. Um, the other uh, work that we'll be doing will be providing some of the, you know, the underlying um, key piece parts that they need to be successful. So they may have an application, but they may want to start to use Elasticsearch, or they may want to start to use Kafka or, or Cassandra. Um, Jenkins is implemented in many different places, but you know, as a practical matter, that should be a shared service model in, in, in terms of best efficiency. So that's the other thing that we do. Um, the third thing is we're like the OpenStack team, we're evangelists for transition. You know, so I think that's one thing that, that you have to keep in the back of your mind when you do these projects is, you know, you, you're going to have to bring people along. You're going to have to put the stuff out there that they can look at, that they can access and they can, they can use, and they can start to see a path forward for their work, right, both on the business and the engineering side. Um, 
we are a small team. So the PaaS team proper is myself and four engineers. Um, and, uh, and, but we have a background that, you know, is what I guess you could say is cloud native. Um, so myself and two of the team members were at HP together. Um, two of the other team members were, uh, were with me at Matt My Fitness um, in the uh, software infrastructure and DevOps group. And so, you know, we have a pretty, pretty skilled and experienced group in dealing with large scale architectures and performance and all that other good jazz. Um, I was running production workloads on AWS when it launched, basically. Um, and so I've been a, you know, I've been, it's an amazing dynamic what that has brought to the table. Um, and, you know, if you've ever been writing the checks when you went from a co-location to the AWS model, you become very, very convinced about the efficacy of that approach. So, um, but we've all done, we all have public and, and personal projects and professional projects that run, you know, all over the place in the, in the cloud deal. And, um, and we have a lot of time with, with OpenStack. So I think one of the, you know, one of the benefits that, that we have is that we went through the entire build cycle at HP for public cloud between Jason's group and my group and, and Haynes. And so, you know, we learned early on how to make this thing run. And so that actually, you know, puts us in a really good position when we want to go put Mesos on top of it, for example. So why do we choose Mesos? Um, you know, there's, <laughs> you don't want to get into like the whole, uh, you know, back and forth about this, that, or the other thing. We kind of feel like, and we looked at this last year um, when we were starting to stand the team up, uh, you know, we went and looked around. And what we find is that, you know, there appears to be, for lack of a better word, a canonical architecture that's developing between OpenShift and Tectonic and Cloud Foundry. And they're going to move towards that Lean OS, Kubernetes container runtime um, package. Um, but for where we were and the size team we were at, it was still a little bit early on with some of the peripheral capabilities, and, and Google didn't give you everything when it, you know, when they they pushed um, Kubernetes out the door. So, so we had to make a decision around the, you know, not just today, but you know, or not just the future, but today and what we could be most successful with. And for us, after we took a look at it, Mesos made a lot of sense. Um, it's been around since 2009. You know the story on it. It's, it's run at scale, big scale, in a lot of places. Um, but one of the things that was really fascinating about um, a, a case study that came out of last year's MesosCon was a, a similar small team, a team of five guys that went through and deployed a fairly extensive application footprint. And that, that resonated with us. Uh, and at that point, we, you know, we, we kind of made our choice um, around that. So, so off to the races we went. And, uh, and so, when we think about this, um, I'm going to circle back around now and talk a little bit about the bigger picture. You can't just throw the cluster out there and call it done. Um, that doesn't help anybody. Um, you got to give the engineering teams the tools they need. You've got to be able to support, you know, legacy monolithic applications that can be containerized and move forward. Um, you have to work with the teams to onboard them. So, so we're, we're, my engineers will go out and work with teams as we get this ramped up to get them in the door and make this thing a success for them. And, and I think that's a big part of, you know, any project like this when you're going to bring these, these new technologies into a, into a legacy architecture. Um, we want to be evangelists. So, you know, that's a, you know, being a change agent has all kinds of interesting aspects to it. It requires patience. Um, it requires a management commitment. Uh, that's a big deal. I mean, I, I oftentimes kind of feel like the engineering side of it is the easiest part. Um, the hardest part is the people side, right? And especially with people that maybe haven't been exposed to some of these approaches and, you know, C true CI, CD, those types of things where you're actually, you know, you're going to rock some people's world. So we have to be ahead of that, pro that, that thing. Um, and we want to be ahead with respect to tooling. So, you know, we want to be able to get out in front and have the stuff ready when they come in and they start asking. But you got to start somewhere. Right? So what do we feel like the compulsory tool set is that you need to provide for the engineering teams internally? Well, I think it starts off, obviously, <laughs> you've got IIS underpinning it. And, and there are, you know, functional aspects of IIS that, that will get used and that we use under the covers. And, you know, it's just a, you know, that's part of the package. Um, you've got to have a private registry. You know, the, one of the big things, you know, if you're in a startup, it's a little bit easier because you don't have the security guys 
breathing down your neck. Um, and you don't have some of the process requirements that are in, in the larger shops. And, and that's a real thing. So obviously you can't go pull stuff willy-nilly off the, you know, the public internet. And so you've got to have your private Git repos and you've got to have your private registries key. Um, CI CD tooling, de facto Jenkins, right? I mean, that's just the, that's the thing. But you want to be able to give the teams an easy way to leverage Jenkins where they don't have to worry about running out of gas, you know, with respect to uh, capacity on the, on doing build slaves and whatnot. And so that is actually one of the most compelling, you know, things about this approach with, uh, with Jenkins and Mesos is that, you know, we can provide very elastic capacity for, for build tools. Um, credential management. Uh, we're, we've got Vault, HashiCorp's Vault, that, uh, that we, you know, we use that internally uh, on the team, and then there's a public service that we'll make available to the, to the other engineering teams. Load balancing. Um, absolutely need to have that for the teams. Uh, you know, sure, you can go ahead and do your HA proxy or do Nginx on your own if you want to, but there's, there's all the other stuff around load balancing and reporting and security and understanding how that works. And, and with the Mesos piece, there, that actually gets to be a little bit more of a complicated picture. And so, um, so you know, Avi had already been present in um, TWC in, in Jason's group uh, for VM-based load balancing. And so we took a long look at that and we ended up with them for our purposes as well. Um, monitoring, you know, StatsD, uh, there's Manask on the OpenStack side. Um, we have stuff that, that we stand up to run our um, tooling in the, in the admin namespace, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but, you know, you might have teams that want to run their own StatsD and, and Graphite and do their own thing and own dashboards. Um, so we want to provide that. Uh, Elk, obviously, um, for log file analysis, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, we find very useful and, and we just feel like this is the, you know, the base tool set to walk in the door that the teams can take advantage of when they want to come onto the platform. So strategic choices. Um, I mentioned the, the three, you know, primaries that we have. So. Um, Let's talk about that. So with Mesos, you know, you get a core cluster management solution, but there's other stuff that you need to run inside the enterprise, right? Like a great example is AD integration. So can you build it? Yeah, absolutely, right? When you got a team of four guys, <laughs> are you gonna go, wanna go write AD integration when you'd really prefer to be out with the engineering teams and onboard them? No. So, you know, Mesosphere brings that to the table. Um, good ACL implementation around, you know, management and access, getting better every day. Um, production ready packages, this is actually a pretty big deal. So, you know, you do have to go through and implement the frameworks, right, to deploy on Marathon. Um, and some of that can get a little bit involved depending on how you want to do it. But one of the great things about what Mesosphere is doing is the, uh, you know, is, is the universe um, repo. And so, They've worked with other, uh, with other shops, for example. They worked extensively with uh, Uber on the, on the latest um, Kafka and Cassandra packages, and that makes our life easier. So what that means for us is we can pretty quickly deliver you know, a, a very robust solution to the engineering teams in some dimension of functionality, which is great, right? Um, Avi, uh, Avi has a great multi-tenancy story um, around how they interact with, uh, with um, Marathon and Mesos. And, uh, and that's really, you know, neat. I mean, when you deploy an application in a marathon, Avi just picks it up and does its thing and gets distributed to the service engines and off you go. And they have a very good multi-tenancy solution on the UI side. They've got a really neat security implementation so you can very easily visualize whitelist, blacklist services talking to each other. It actually smooths the, you know, makes, again, back to some of those mundane tasks that your teams or we would have to build or your teams would have to deal with. Um, can be done, you know, fairly easily. Um, and then CoreOS for the, reg the private registry, uh, we've been super happy with that. Um, out of the box, it, it dropped into our CI/CD uh, tool chain, and you're going to see that in a little bit. And we've been we've been zipping and zooming with that. So, um, design considerations, <laughs> the pro tip. So, <laughs> ah, there we go. Pardon me. Um, so, you know, obviously every OpenStack implementation is going to have its dimensions that are unique to it, and, and ours is no different. 
Um, you know, the, the big thing for us in looking at running what could potentially be really big clusters on top of OpenStack is how's the network layout going to work out? You know, what do we need to be thinking about there? What, where are we at with, you know, with router reliability and all those things? Because, you know, as soon as you start talking back and forth among cluster nodes and things go south on the network side, then the cluster is, you know, pretty much useless. So, um, so that, those were all considerations. HA is really key. Um, we, you know, we need NFS at the current um, version of Jenkins because it stores state in the file system, and so that's an aspect of our cluster build. Um, and uh, multi-region image sync, you know, the little things around making your life easier and leveraging the, the tooling that the, uh, that the OpenStack IIS side provides. Um, we do take advantage of that. Um, and then there is a decision on the topic of one cluster versus many. You could, you know, from a production applications perspective, uh, but it turns out that really kind of when you sit down and talk to the, you know, the hardcore long-term Mesos folks, it's a one cluster deal for production as opposed to multiples. And, uh, and, and you kind of get the feel for that once you start digging in. Um, bare metal. <laughs> so I mentioned this in the, uh, in the keynote this morning and I, I called Jason out and, you know, I said basically I nag him about once a week um, for bare metal. So with, with Mesos, you really kind of want to run on bare metal. Um, there's, you know, VM virtualization kind of just adds latency is a practical matter. So, so we're going to be pushing real hard to get on to uh, get those guys moving on ironic um, as soon as we possibly can. Implementation architecture. So you decided to go do this thing. You want to run Mesos. Well, you got to run the cluster. So what other stuff do you need to do? How are you going to turn it on? How are you going to, how are you going to get it going? How are you going to maintain it? You know, how are you going to monitor it? What is the actual operational footprint that you're going to have to have to make this thing go? And so that's a big deal. Um, so our model uh, and our approach um, goes something like this. So we view the world in terms of network cores, right? So at TWC, we actually have multiple network cores. And so our, our namespacing starts at the network level. So right now we're in the, uh, in the OpenStack network core. And then we think about regions. And then we think about environments, development, production, and staging. Um, and then we think about the functional namespace, and for that we have admin and we have Mesos. And, and all of the customer-facing workloads run on the Mesos cluster in that namespace. Um, and by namespace, I, mean, I guess it's, it is what it is. But, uh, and then on the admin side is where we have our bootstrapping uh, services, the things that we use to, you know, to manage credentials. We, you know, we have our own admin versions of Vault, um, admin versions of Jenkins. Uh, admin versions of Quay, and so that allows us to, to run the thing and present the cluster effectively um, from an operational side. And that's actually a pretty big ask part of what you have to do to kind of get this thing ready to go and, and long-term manage it. So I hope you can see this, and I apologize if that text is a little bit small. Um, so basically this is the best way to look at it. And we don't expose any services um, in the functional namespace external, or in the admin namespace, externally. Um, those are all for our purposes. Everything the custom, customers see are in the Mesos namespace. And um, these are separate OpenStack projects. So that's a key consideration. So we do have some isolation there uh, around that for a variety of reasons. So some comments on the Neutron setup, because going back to the networking, we, we started in with a specific model. And the thinking around that model was, hey, we really want to have you know, so, some isolation in the networks with the routers and how they talk to the outside world, and, and how do we want to make that work? So we actually had multiple networks in our Mesos namespace at one point, um, and routers in between them all talking back into the admin namespace. So two things with that. One, we ran into some quirky things under the covers with Neutron that made that actually pretty challenging when you talk about automated build. It actually was really hard, and it just flat out was a problem. Um, the other thing is the, the IIS team is, um, has reworked their approach with that, and they've got a kind of a novel deal where they're spreading the routers out, the virtual routers out over the compute nodes. And so what that does there is basically, you know, in a traditional model, you're, you've got all the stuff running on a couple of, no, of you know, no, router nodes, and if you lose a router node, you lose a whole lot of virtual routers. So, what they're doing is spreading that out. And that actually kind of took some of the pressure off of us to deal with that in our network design. 
And as soon as you start simplifying your network design for deployment, life gets a lot easier for the automation side of things, and that's actually how that worked out. Um, and it's been actually really good. And so, uh, so that's, that, that one is just something to, to think about, and you may want to chat a little bit with Jason and crew about how they're going about that process with, uh, with spreading them out. So let's move on to operational automation. So when you've got a team of four, automation is the only way you're going to survive once you actually start to run things in production. Um, it simply will overpower, especially if you're doing multi-region, which we will. Um, so that is a huge deal. And so we've been working on that almost since the get-go. Um, and you have to do the work up front because there's no way you're going to catch up to this on the back end. And you know, I think we've all been in projects where it's, you know, you're under a ton of pressure and you know, you've got to get this thing out the door. And meanwhile, some of that automation that you would have really loved to have had done up front has to be, you know, dealt with coming back around. And that's never an easy discussion to have. So, um, so we're fortunate in that, you know, we've been able to take the time up front to do that. And that's been, you know, a big chunk of our work package um, up to this point. Uh, and, and that's why I'm running this thing for you in the background, which is the, you know, the full cluster build. Um, we ended up with Ansible. Uh, the team has, as I'm sure all of you have, or used everything out there. Um, we've been really happy with it. I, I think uh, we're, we're, as we get, you know, more and more well-oiled in how to, to use it, um, but already, uh, you know, we're pretty fully automated on most major tasks running the cluster. Um, and that's a mandate, right? So, you know, I kind of put that on the table when we started is, you know, once, once we get down the road and we're ready to say, all right, come on and board customers, there's no more touching production manually. A anything that we would need to do there, you really need to do automatically. Um, and so that's, that's actually driven the, the process and it's, it's pretty well burned in and we're on the right track there. So this last one is kind of funny. Um, Adam and I are both bike guys. We live in Austin. And so, you know, we'll occasionally ride together. But, uh, but when we were first getting down the road, you know, Adam, I was like, I want to see the automated cluster build. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to go ride my bike. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> he's, don't worry. Click. It'll be ready in 15, 20 minutes when the, when the job completes. And I'll be back, you know, in a little while on the bike. And I was like, all right. So 15, 20 minutes, I went in there. And we're done. And I'm happy. So, you know, I think one of the things about automation that's really, uh, you know, a key thing is like, you know, that's engineer happiness, right? And I'm sure everybody in this room from the engineering side, you're like, yes, you know, make my life easier. Don't make my life harder and crappier, right? So give me time to automate and then I can go be productive and, you know, and I think it's, you know, the anecdotes here obviously, but I think that's something to keep in the back of your mind across all this is just full commitment to automation across the board. All right. So, got, uh, got plenty of time left here. Um, it's demo time. So let's take a little look over here and see how we're doing on the cluster build. Eh, we're almost there. Um, so, uh, so let's talk a little bit about this and then hopefully by the time I'm done with this slide, it'll be, it'll be wrapped up. Um, so basically the way it works is, you know, there is a ticketing process to create an OpenStack project because there is some administrative and some ultimately some chargeback um, mappings that need to get put in and approvals to go consume the resources. Once that's done um, and the quotas are updated to accommodate what we want to do, then um, we're off to the races. And so uh, the way it works right now is we have a couple different, you know, primary Ansible jobs. One is, a, is an OpenStack provisioning job and it'll go through and spin up everything, right? So kind of like a heat deal, but, you know, it, we keep it in Ansible, everything in Ansible, so we're consistent across the board. Um, once that job is complete, then away you go into the Mesos cluster build. And so that actually will go through, um, and I've already run the, the provisioning, so we're just running the, uh, the Mesos book right now. Um, once that's complete, then the Mesos cluster builds, that actually will build Avi as well. Uh, and install that, um, but that actually pushes me a little bit past my demo allotment of time as far as runtime goes. So we, uh, we we didn't choose to uh, run that at the tail end of this this time. But um, but yeah, so then you you know you can build all the way out, and you're done. So I have to be patient here. <laughs> oh, we're done. Fancy that. So uh, so at this point, I think one of the cool things is so the cluster's run. It's running. Um, You'll notice data has started to flow. 
So, um, oh, I'm sorry, as I was. There we go. So, once the thing, it, it's automatically wired in. So the, the, meso, the, the Ansible job will go ahead and install and do all the plumbing um, with Plec D to get everything flowing. So you can go build a cluster, you're wired into reporting right away and away you go. Um, and that data's flowing now, as you can see. And then, let's see if we got, we're live here. And away you go. So while we were talking, the cluster got built, it got inserted into monitoring, and you're off to the races. And at that point, you go run another package to put Cassandra or whatever on there. Or, you know, if you are running in the DCOS model with Mesosphere, you could just go do it at the command line if you wanted. When we do installs like for Cassandra and whatnot, those are actually running DCOS, you know, commands when we do install the package into the covers. So that's not the only demo I have for you, because I think one of the things that, uh, that actually is pretty cool. Um, so, you know, I think everybody at one point, I hope, had the experience, you know, or the aha moment when they, hit, they did get push Heroku master and magic things happened, right, and your application was deployed to production. Um, it, was a pretty, it was a pretty foundational moment, I think, in, in basically in true CI CD automation, because if you'd been around on Amazon for a while, you're pretty much building your own clustering and, and dealing with all these things manually, and all of a sudden, boom, done, right? So as an engineer, you know, it was really a powerful tool. Of course, you could, you know, very easily get yourself into trouble with that. But I think the point of it is, is like, you know, if you go back to what we were talking about with, uh, with the whole, you know, the whole desire to enable teams and engineering teams and make their lives better, I kind of, this is a mantra, right? And I kind of preach this thing all the time to the team um, because that's just that level of simplicity. Now, you may not always get to, you know, to the point where you can do a one-liner like that and just be out the door because there's some complex packages, you know, and application form, you know, footprints that you need to get out. But that should always be the driver of what you're trying to deliver to the engineering teams when you're going to do this type of service. Um, so, you know, and I ask myself oftentimes when we, talk, when we talk about it as a team, it's like, well, you know, this can be harder, but then you got to ask why, right? And if you go tear it down enough, you can find a way to make things a lot easier um, for the folks to consume your, your, your platform. Um, so we make this a priority. Um, so what I want to do now is show you uh, what we call our single service CI CD um, tool chain. And so basically, I'm showing you this presentation on Go Present. Um, so it's basically a simple binary, points at some content files, it's got under the covers some, uh, you know, some TWC branded stuff. I have this thing running internally and I think ultimately we'll provide it as a service because if you want to do a presentation and you just want to write a text file and magic stuff happens and you get slides, it's awesome, right? But it's also a single service. So you do have to get a binary from GitHub update through Docker build and then out Jenkins onto Marathon, restarted and behind the, the Avi VIP. So it may seem simple, but this is the same thing you do if you just had a single service binary doing some other thing, you know, or whatever you want to do there. So, um, so let's take it from here. Uh, so at this point, I just need to go send this package away. And so at this point, once that happens, then our friendly Quay will be listening for that and we'll start the build in theory. And let's hope my demo luck holds. There we go. So it's, uh, it's working its way down there. Jenkins will pick this up when it's done. There you go, you got jobs pending. And so this happens pretty fast on the restart, so if we miss it, um, I apologize. So at any rate, I made a small change. Um, success, let's hope I didn't shoot myself with that one either. And we're waiting for executors, and we're waiting.
All right. So that's finished. And somewhere there's a restart happening on Avi. And there it is. So, so that was basically a full CI CD run, you know, for what it's worth, you know. Woohoo. So, so I'm really happy that both those things actually work because this could have gone really badly. Um, so, uh, so the, the Prezo's updated. Um, and so, away we go. So, so for us, uh, what happens next is uh, we've got, you know, we're pretty much all done and ready to go out the door, um, X some destructive testing. So we'll spend the next couple of weeks banging away at it and trying to make it do all kinds of bad things. And then uh, at the end of this month, or May, I guess we're in month, or if we're in May now, at the end of May, we'll put people on the platform and get going. Um, and at that point, we'll spend a lot of time with the customers and, you know, we'll get out there and do our thing. So, um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I have Terry Howe and Adam McManus with me from my team. Um, and uh, so if you have any questions, and I may or may not be able to answer them, fortunately these guys will. <laughs> so if you could, I guess they want you to go to the microphone so they get it recorded for the, the replay. So Gavin, you have to head over there. So is, uh, are you deploying a separate Mesos cluster for each uh, customer? It seemed like they got no. open. No, okay. No, so they get a, they, they, they will get a marathon instance and then Avi on top of that, multi-tenants in on top of that. So but it's a single cluster. Single, single Mesos okay. cluster, okay. right, right, right. right, right. Cool. Thanks. You're talking earlier about running um, traditional monolithic apps. Uh, this isn't. Um, can you talk about any real world issues you run into doing that and um, in general a lot of, well, now it's like really loud, um, <laughs> a lot of customers I've talked to have tried doing that and they've just run into mm -hmm. a lot of real world constraints but obviously yeah. that seems like the holy grail so uh, if you have any learnings. You know we, we haven't really even started to dig into that hard Gavin. Um, so. There are, abs there are absolutely some classic applications where that'll be a problem. And, and, and so, you're, you know, if you can get it into a container, then we can run it. Um, and, I think, and I think we'll just have to take those case by case. I mean, there's going to be some, some big architectures, for example. I know, you know, there's been some efforts internally around the Adobe Enterprise Manager because we use that for a lot of content management. It's a big footprint. Um, and they've had challenges getting that in there. But we haven't started to work with them yet. I think there's other, there are other opportunities that we are aware of where we know the high level of what this particular thing does, and we'll be able to get it in there. Uh, it's just a matter, but we haven't, you know, we're still not in production yet, so our focus has been on get the cluster and, and all the operational tooling in place, and then we'll start really digging in with the customers. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, so you started out with a uh, very uh, emphatic claim that you should begin with IIS. <laughs> and uh, my question is this, if you didn't have one already, would you still begin there or would you start with some other bare metal provisioning um, system to begin? Well, I mean, you'd have to, yeah. You'd have to take stock of the resources that you have, because what it, what it does for you is like it takes networking out of the picture, it takes all the hardware, physical provisioning out of the picture, all of that selection. Um, you know, if you have those resources uh, and they can be committed to your project, then with Mesos, yes, you can run it on bare metal. Um, but for us, you know, and your team size is really critical there. So for us, it was you know, it was important. I'd say that, you know, in a large shop. You should have IIS first because not everybody's going to land on a container platform, right? You're going to have VM specific workloads that have to persist for a while. Um, right now, uh, we, don't, we can't schedule VMs um, with this tooling. Mesosphere has hinted about it, um, but, but that's not really what this is for. I and mean, we don't view it that way. It's not a high priority for us because we have IIS. 
So I, I think it's just, you know, if you don't have it internally, you have to decide whether you're going to do it internally or you're going to go outside to a public provider. Um, but, you know, it, it's, if you can take four people and kick this thing out the door in three, four months, you know, with a pretty high degree of, of operational readiness, then that's saying a lot about all the, the, the add-ons that, or the foundation that IIS gives you. Did I answer your question? Absolutely. Thank okay. you. Just a quick question. Uh, regarding operationalizing the, your clusters after, remember you're going to be dealing with so many teams uh, later on mm -hmm. in your organization. So what is your plan in the future? Are you going to give them access to the cluster, the Mesa's clusters? Because remember, you're going to be running one cluster and multi-tenants in there. Right. How are you going to manage all of this if you can just elaborate? Well, so they have access to their Marathon instance. So they can, they can run frameworks, whatever they so desire, right? And the same thing with Avi. So those, those, are where, those are the multi-tenant interfaces for the customer. The, the underlying Mesos cluster, they don't need, really need to have access to that. You know, dealing with the Mesos side of the thing is really just making sure that you've got enough capacity you know, in available um, IAS or bare metal to you know, throw those nodes in another cluster and go to town. But all the, all the end users will have their own interface and they'll be able to do you know, what they need to do to run uh, is really what it boils down to. Quick question. Um, the network infrastructure underneath your cluster, mm -hmm. what are you running there? Are you running just a pure layer three CMP network? Do you have overlay underlay? You know, how are you managing that to, to basically provide the connectivity for all the, the underlay or the services underneath? Yeah, so I'm going to let Jason answer that question. It's OVS yeah. into Juniper. So you're, you're basically using a pure layer three network from the network infrastructure side to provide the OVS connectivity between compute nodes. That was an affirmative answer, yes. Right. Um, I'll repeat that. Oh, so the question was what was the, uh, what was the network plumbing underneath? Um, and it's OVS and the layer three. And it's Juniper hardware, I think, is, is what the, uh, the platform is. Great. Hi. Um, do you have the monitoring system on your application that you deploy, or do you have any plan for the monitoring? So, okay, so we will provide some plumbing for consumers of our platform to monitor their applications. Um, that is a service, right? We, mon we have a separate monitoring ecosystem for our purposes and operating the, the, plat the clusters. Um, Jason also provides Manasca as a monitoring as a service. So there's a, there's a variety of tooling that the, that the application, the people deploying applications on the platform can take advantage of, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that monitoring for them. Okay. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, so it means that uh, the people who are responsible for the application will have to re responsibility for the monitoring by themselves. Yeah, no, they should be, right? I mean, this is kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, the engineering teams need to own their app and they need to be looking at it, you know, all the time. And, you know, w we've had this discussion internally where it's like, you know, in a classic enterprise shop, you've got a knock somewhere and they've got monitoring and all that. But, you know, I always say, look, if the knock ever tells me that my platform is hurting before I already know about it from, you know, my monitoring, alerting, and pager duty, then I'm probably going to be pretty irritated. So, um, so no, I think the engineering teams, the, the, the responsibility is on the engineering teams. And what that does is it makes sure, it, it assures that they are doing the instrumentation inside their application footprint. They know it and they, you know, and they're in tune with the health of their, their, their application. Um, so this is absolutely, you know, we stop at a very specific level and they own the rest. Okay, uh, for, the, for this, first of all, question is, will, be, uh, do you, will you provide a monitoring system, I mean, like a console as a tool for them, or just they have to fight by themselves? No, 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 we will. Um, there will actually be several monitoring services that they can take advantage of. We'll have some on our side um, that, are, that are published as a service, and then Jason provides the OpenStack Manasca um, tooling, and they can plug into each one and do both, right? So they have some redundancy there. So yeah, they, they'll have plenty of options for monitoring. Oh, okay. So I'm looking forward for your monitoring system then. Yep, yep, yep. Thanks. What's that? Oh yeah. So um, 
There is a Manaska, um, one of Jason's uh, team members is doing a Manaska presentation tomorrow. I don't know what time. Yeah. So you might want to check that out. Hi. Uh, have you done anything to integrate um, persistent storage or any of the IAS offerings around block storage into Mesos as like Docker volumes, for example? Uh, are we doing just NFS at this point and then the EBS behind the, the instances themselves? Um, so that is a topic that we will get to, but we have not started into it yet. That's, that's an interesting one. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any others? Think we're good? So um, you mentioned um, that you guys are doing chargeback uh, against the OpenStack project. Are you, how are you and are you doing uh, chargeback against the PaaS? So there is a set of metrics that are emitted um, and currently they get us most of what we need to map there. There is a little bit of subtlety to that, to that because we don't know, for example, the OpenStack tenant ID that that actually all that chargeback flows through and collects. So we're working on how we're going to tackle that. But there's also more metrics around chargeback that are, that are coming from an add-on package from Mesosphere. So that's going to be the tricky part is how we actually map into that. And we will get there. Cool. Looking forward to hearing back. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.